But hello, everybody, and welcome. It's 6.30, and I'm Hunter Ohanian, the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, and I'm very pleased to have as my guest this evening, Liz Collins. Hi, Liz. Hi, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Welcome to South Florida and Fort Lauderdale. Thank you. <laughs> and where are we finding you this evening? Um, I'm in the Kensington neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, what's the wet weather like there? Um, it's a beautiful fall climate, a little warm, you know, kind of mellow autumn feeling. Mm -hmm. nice. well, it's starting to get cold at night. The heat went on in my apartment yesterday. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, I've been here in, uh, in South Florida now for two years and it's, you know, I sort of am missing, I'm hearing from everybody about how fall's happening in these different places and I'm missing it a little bit, but then when I think about the snow shoveling and all that stuff, it's like, no, I don't want that, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so just for those of you, if this is your first time, uh, welcome, Stonewall National um, Archives and Museum in Fort Lauderdale. We've been around for 47 years. In our library, we have 28,000 books, and I'm happy to say we have 28,001, which will be uh, Liz Collins's new book, the catalog from her show, which we're going to be talking about, which is great. Um, in our archives, we have 2,700 feet of queer material, and 2,700 linear feet works out to one side up the Empire State Building and all the way down the other. It's, it, it totals about six million pages of queer archives. And so you can find out everything about us at stonewall-museum.org. And if you're not signed up for our um, uh, newsletters, please do, do that because uh, you get to see everything that's going on, these great talks that, we, that we've been able to do. We started these in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, it's been interesting. It was um, Esther Newton was the very first one back in June. And we've had a great series of people who've come on. And, you know, I haven't talked a little bit about this. I haven't talked about this in a few weeks, but archivally, it's important to think about how queer folks are dealing with everything that's going on in the world right now. And we're trying to actually present art and writing and, and thought in this situation. Um, Right now, we're at a bit of, of an inflection point. Um, I think we're at 196,000 people who've died in the United States um, in the last seven months. Um, and we're running right into a big election. And so uh, we're about 55 days away fr from that. And so it's, um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting time. Um, and um, so for those of you who are here, thank you for being here. Um, if you have friends who or not, not able to join us. Uh, we're simulcasting this on Facebook. And so that will be recorded there. And then this will also be recorded um, on our website. And actually, if you go to, I think it's called public programming and then go down to virtual events, you can see everybody who has been in the series. Of course, all of these talks will be archived in our archive as well. Um, I want to do a shout out to Emery Grant. Emery, show yourself if you can to everybody. Um, and there, hello, Emery Grant is our uh, deputy director and he does a great job. Hello, Emery, thank you. And he's sort of the t technical person behind the scenes here. Um, and um, so I think I'm gonna stop there. And uh, Liz, just quick, quickly, how are you doing with this whole COVID thing? I know you have a, you have a young child um, and there's been a lot going on. How are you do doing? Thanks, Hunter. Um, I'm doing well. Uh, as we spoke about briefly before the talk started, um, I just spent a month in Provincetown, so that made my life exponentially better. Um, I have a show that's up there at Amp Gallery. I'm sharing the gallery with Justin Vivian Bond, and um, we both have great shows there, and so that's been really nice to have a exhibition up. Um, makes me feel better being in New York in September, knowing that I just had a show open and because, you know, there are a lot of shows opening here. It, it feels, I mean, I haven't been out and about, but it does feel like a, uh, you know, business as usual to some degree that in, in terms of what's coming in my inbox and what I'm seeing on Instagram as far as things happening. I'm good. I'm tired. It's September is intense. It's typically intense. So um, it's just like 
all of a sudden everything's crazy. You go from doing kind of nothing to doing everything and um, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. So that's just adding on top and immense anxiety about the election daily. Of course, the, the election of course is occupying a lot of people's um, uh, mental energy. So are you teaching at RISD this year? Hunter, I have not been teaching at RISD for seven years. Oh my goodness, wow. Sorry to be yeah. on times there, yeah. Okay, I'm a, I think, I like to think of myself as a retired academic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's like a, I feel like I have to carry on a legacy of early retirement. My dad retired from the Navy when he was 43 um, after serving for a long time and it was kind of amazing in hindsight that he retired that early. Um, so, you know, following in the footsteps. <laughs> well, but that's good. And those are great footsteps to follow in. So that's wonderful. So, yeah, just, I'm working on my projects. I'm working on my art and design projects full time as I have been for a while now. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. I think I did a studio visit with you with maybe like three or four years ago it was probably the last time I saw you. So, yeah. So, um, just to give everybody a little bit of a background about Liz, uh, Liz works fluidly between art and design, and I think that's an important uh, thing to th think about as we talk about uh, tonight's project. Um, and with emphasis on experience in textile me media, uh, Liz's solo exhibitions and installations have been presented uh, in New York at the Museum of Arts and Design, Heller, uh, the uh, Bureau of General Services Queer Division, and at NADA. Uh, she's done shows and projects at the Tang, which we're going to talk about a lot tonight. Um, I know that she certainly did, did a show at Leslie Lohman. She was part of Queer Threads there, and we moved that to a number of cities as well. Um, and she's had uh, residencies and fellowships at McDowell, at Yaddo, Haystack, uh, the Two Trees Cultural S uh, Subsidy Studio Program in Brooklyn. Um, and she's also been a queer art mentor. Uh, through the Queer Mentorship Program too, which is which is great. So thank you for being here. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. And just one other thing I want to mention is that Liz and I will be chatting. If you've got questions, throw them into either the chat portion or the Q&A portion. Uh, we'll get to them as we go through this. Um, and so we're, we kind of, we like to leave the last 15 minutes for questions, but uh, Liz and I will kind of go through some of the stuff here. So Liz, the, the reason why I wanted to, first of all, it's always nice to see you, but also I wanted to talk to you about this book. I wanted to talk to you about this amazing catalog um, and tell us a little bit about the exhibition and how it came about. Okay. Um, well, the exhibition was, well, first of all, the catalog that Hunter's holding up and I can hold up to um, is um, a document that shows the, this project that was an exhibition installation at the Tang Museum called Energy Field. And the Tang Museum, which is uh, at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York, it's a beautiful contemporary museum um, that I had worked with before that, uh, they invited me to transform this space um, that was a mezzanine space, that was a kind of in-between space between the downstairs galleries and the upstairs galleries. There was this kind of weird in-between space that the uh, architect had designed to be um, kind of a lounge area, uh, but that for many years the museum had been using it for exhibition space. So in 2000, 15 they invited me to take over this space and they gave it to me for two years so I was the first one in this new program that happens in this that space the tang tends to like to do kind of series of things so this this energy field project was the first um, two-year installation in the mezzanine space so they gave it over to me and commissioned me to come up with a an idea and uh, to transform the space into a social space, not just a, an installation that people could look at and enjoy, but a place that they could use um, to, in various ways from having, like people being able to hang out there to um, them being able to program into the space. 
So I set to um, fulfilling that request and it became this wonderful project. And um, part of my initial request when being asked to do this project was that I would like a book. <laughs> if I was going to do this project, I would like a book because they, the Tang has a long history of creating publications. Um, if you go on the Tang Museum website in the publications window, you will see that they have made incredible books. There's an Alma Thomas book because anything they've had a great show of, Nancy Grossman, uh, Nicholas Krushnik, on and on and on. They're incredible books. So I said, well, if I'm going to do something big here, I need a book. So indeed, I got a great book. And um, yeah, it's an interesting show. So we can talk about it. And I have a lot of pictures to show you. Yeah. And of course, uh, of course we want to see some of the pictures. So my understanding is that the exhibition was roughly uh, 2015 to 2017. Is that right? Yeah, it was September 15 to, I think, September 17. <laughs> and, and then you were not only the artist, but you were also a curator for it. So you brought other people into the show as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't think of myself as a curator. For some reason, I am not willing to call myself a curator. <laughs> I'm not willing to give put that as part of what I do because I already have artist and designer as this hybrid kind of career. And also um, curators do something that I don't, I, my, my, what I do is not necessarily curating always. Um, sometimes I'm inviting people to do something and there's nothing I'm really curating. I'm just asking people to work with me or I'm proposing a context and inviting people to put something in it, you know, to fill it. Um, so I did a lot of programming for the space that had to do with my network of people. Um, and the kind of what some might see as curation really was um, a series of different interventions that I invited some of my beloved people to come up with in response to my installation. And so the contents and the kind of, um, I mean, including my own contents, like I, I rearranged the room several times and switched our, out art, moved it around, changed the color of the walls um, to keep it interesting for myself. But also um, I had a different artist or art collaborative pair, or, um, yeah, duo, I think there were a couple different collaborations. I invited different people to come in like every five months or so. So there were these rotations. And then on top of that, there was some live programming that I did. And then there was a whole lot of programming that the museum and the school did too. Right. And of course it did certainly impact the community there at Skidmore as far as the students and also the area around them as well too, because it gave them different opportunities to come in and see the space and participate in the space. Yeah, I mean, I really took on the context in a, in a very serious way in terms of this, this museum being located on the campus of a college in a small town in upstate New York. So the campus, which I already knew kind of well from, yeah, and I don't know. Uh-oh, I'm losing you. Is it me or you? Is my connection bad or? Anyway, um, I knew that I knew that I was creating something for a place where people were actually living nearby on the grounds of that museum. And um, I, I thought about how the students and others, the faculty, the whole community would need this thing that I made to change in order to keep coming back and seeing new things, you know, like for myself and for them. And it, it's funny, sometimes I, I relate some of my thinking processes to my former career as a fashion designer, like there's these funny connections, like with fashion, you used to have to like 
change, you know, like come up with new things like every few months even it got really accelerated and 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 so that customers would keep coming back you know they wouldn't go to the store once a season they keep coming back for that next delivery so i kind of thought of it like that like oh well the students they they see it and they go okay this is cool i can hang out here and i'll come back and it'll be the same no you'll come back and it'll be something totally different so yeah um was there a sense, was there a sense that there was a queerness to the installation? Well, yeah, I mean, it was queer in a lot of ways, you know, if we talk about like what queering is, I mean, I, I queered the museum in a way and that I subverted a, a kind of context, like I made it like a domestic space and um, it was very kind of disarming in in certain ways, like to enter that space. I put a wall-to-wall -wall carpet down and made it look kind of like a surreal um, otherworldly living room dance studio. Like there was a mirror on the wall that was like the mirrors you see in, in dance studios, like floor to ceiling wall of mirror. It, it, it kind of turned things upside down for people. Also um, the experience of seeing furniture in a museum and not knowing if you can sit on it or not is very, um, it's, uh, it's a real thing. Um, it's, it's something that I think just that idea of like subverting function is um, something queer. And then within the um, contents, you know, I think almost everybody or everybody in the network of artists who were showing were queer people. And then I had this whole other library thing that was happening where I invited all these people to contribute books, anybody I knew or kind of idolized or had met, you know, anybody from my kind of extended web of people. Um, I invited those publications in and put them all on a book cart so that, you know, when people came into the space, they could also treat it a little bit like a library, you know, or a reading room. I love the reading room idea. And when I was a student at RISD, I spent a lot of time in the library, just like sitting in comfortable chairs, reading and falling asleep. Like that was my way to rest. And I like that. I, I liked imagining people doing that. So I created that kind of condition. So let's show our viewers some of the slides you put together about the exhibition, and some of the work that was in it. All right, let's do it. So here we go. So what I'm going to do now is, um, this is actually a PDF of the book because I have, you know, it was already there rather than take pictures of all the spreads. Um, you can see that, you know, there's a real physicality to this book. And once we get off the share screen, I'll show you the binding because it's really exquisite. There's something very important about the book design. I mean, there are many important things. Beverly Joel of Pulp Inc. is a brilliant book designer. She did it. Anyway, the contents inside um, are as follows. So this is a nice view of one of the iterations of the space. So I can just scroll through some of these images and chat about things. Here's an important thing to look at. Um, I don't know, my little window of Hunter and me is in the way I'm gonna move it over. So if you can see on the right, the table of contents there We've got um, in this book, a lot of different things. So it's an interesting book in that it's a document of my project, but what we did for the book was um, not just document the project, but invite each of the artists who contributed to the project to write something um, or contribute something to the book. Um, so here we have Nalen Blake, and I'll show you the pictures after Evie Day. And then this is from two Tang 
for two Skidmore students and alumni, a, a little story. Um, Mike Albo, Shelly Marlowe, Leah Devon and Lauren Siegel, uh, Laurel Sparks, Scott, Jennifer Cabot, Peggy Shaw, Amelia Bond. Bande, I never know how to say her last name right. Sorry, Amelia. So um, some of those people are writers. You all might recognize some of these names and um, some are visual artists and some are performance artists. And so um, in the case of the writers, I had readings. I had these readings or conversations. Um, and then, oh, also up at the top, a dialogue with Ian Barry, Liz Collins and Julia Bryan Wilson. So we did that conversation. Um, there were performances, there were readings, there were conversations. There were then also these, these installations. So we have, um, this was before any artist showed up. This was just me. So this was the first, what it looked like at the beginning. And- Let, let me interrupt here and ask you about this image versus the end. So. There is a, there's, there's definitely a point of view in this first installation. It's incredibly beautiful. Thank um, you. But as, as things changed, did you miss this point of view or, or were you happy as things moved along? No, I didn't miss it at all. I mean, it just, it was a living organism. <laughs> you know, it was like, um, I welcomed the changes each time they happened the same way I would welcome rearranging the furniture in my house, you know, if I was there a lot. I just, I, it, it made sense to have it evolve. It wasn't just, I, I don't, I also just don't attach myself to a lot of things, to be honest. I like, I like the, the fluidity. I mean, that's another kind of queerness about the nature of my work. And I, I've thought about this more and more as the years have gone on and like how so much is fluid, even the fluidity between art and design. And like, I love that the fluid connections, you know, and, and not being in any kind of binary. Sure. So I wrote an essay, I'm very proud of it. Sometimes my writing's not so great, but this one, it felt really good. So this is an example of a school event. I don't really know what's going on here. Oh, in the lower left, you can say, in the beginning, a creation story circle. Like the, the faculty and students did all kinds of great things in, in this space. They really, really loved it. Everybody loved it. So that's really wonderful for me. I mean, it was very moving to hear the impressions and experiences all along. Um, during the run of this show. It was really um, a fantastic experience to know that so many people got so much out of this environment. Here I am with Julia and Ian. Julia is a longtime um, friend and colleague of mine and um, a well-known art historian and professor. And we had a nice conversation with Ian Barry, who is the director of the Tang Museum and also the head curator. And here's Nalen's project. I won't, I won't go through every page and go slowly because I don't think we really have time for that, but why can't I go, why can't I advance? So Nalen had a great installation there that involved his dog and a sock monkey and um, our connection. There was a video um, that he's shown in other places, including his last show at LAC, uh, was it? Was it LACMA? No, the, the LA Museum where he had that huge show. It's a video called Stab, which also was in my installation at the new museum. There are all these interconnected things. Like actually the first time I went to the Tang um, years before to do another project as part of a show called Dance Draw, I met Ian and we discovered within five minutes that we had all of these people in common, including Nayland. And it's, it's that kind of place where um, there's a lot, lot of interconnectivity. And once you do something with the Tang, it, it, be, it becomes like a family, you know, it's a familial kind of feeling and a, a web of interconnected people. Um, this was EV Day's project, which was an amazing installation in the window. Um, 
where she uh, had a whole other plan for this project. Evie's a brilliant artist and a dear friend of mine and is very, very um, engineer-like in her installations. And she had this plan and then the um, Pulse um, massacre happened down in Florida and she kind of redirected herself and created this project that was in response to that um, hor horrific event um, called Perpetual Motion, Perpetual Motion. So you see the space is starting to get even more crazy with all the layers. Um, then yeah, just more images of the space with her piece in there. Why is it going back and forth? Okay, and then there's an essay there. Here's my dear friend Mike um, reading. So Mike and Shelly came up, Mike Albo and Shelly Marlowe came up and did readings of um, novels that they were working on. They were both did like work in progress readings. That was a really hot night of kind of sexy queer literature. <laughs> yes, tell people, tell people a little bit about Mike Elbow. I, I, Elbow, he's a wonderful artist, a wonderful writer. Yeah, well, there you just told about him. He really is. And I, you know, he's a performer, writer, comedian. Um, he's so many things. He's brilliant. And um, he's been a dear friend of mine for years also, and a P-Town friend as well, Hunter. And so he um, has been working on a great kind of um, sci-fi novel that uh, will come out soon. And it's, I think it's called Touch Anywhere to Begin. And it's a really great queer um, kind of online cyber story that, so if you get the book, you can read an excerpt of it. But Mike lives here in New York and, um, has been out in the world for a long time. He has a performance group called, um, is it called U Unitard? <laughs> I forget what it's called. <laughs> it's hilarious. Uh, Leah Devon and Lauren Siegel did an incredible piece, three channel video um, for which the Tang constructed a three video rig to go in the corner of the space. Beautiful project called The Summit. Um, and it was just an exquisite piece, this video, and I hope it gets more um, play out in the world it's, uh, based on the life of this opera singer. Now here you can see um, the wall is now gray, that it was, uh, I can't remember what color before, maybe white, and I've changed some of the art on the walls. Laurel Sparks comes in with her Liquid Sky monologue, which was an amazing piece. I mean, black light monologue, but it was, um, she kind of reenacted the monologue in Liquid Sky, that film that I'm obsessed with and have used in my own work, like for the New Museum Project. Um, she, she did the monologue from that part where the, um, the model characters in the black light. And so it was amazing to know that she did that because it was like one of those things like, oh, I've, I've always wanted to do that. Thank you, Laurel, you did it. So let's put it in here. And just, uh, as, an aside, just as an aside, I totally agree with you about Liquid Sky. And if people have not seen it, uh, I think it was what, 1981, 1983? 81. Uh, 81. I remember seeing it uh, when it came out. It changed my life at the time. And uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's actually not that easy to find necessarily. But, um, but it's, it's not a streaming. You cannot stream that movie. No. But it's definitely worth find, finding Liquid Sky. Yeah, it, it, that movie had a huge impact on me and uh, that's what my trigger installation was all about. Um, and then I did another one in LA that was an offshoot of that where I got to actually um, build an installation that had a vanity room with liquid sky kind of film still wallpaper that was day glow. And there were mirrors with built in videos that Lauren Siegel made of like neon makeup tutorials and it just all, it, it, it's like it, the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you, Slava Zuckerman, for creating that incredible film. 
Sco Jill is Jill Pangalo and Alex P. White. They are both creative artists, designer, performers um, on their own, but have this crazy project called SCOAT where they make these costumes and kind of treat themselves as uh, art, so as sculpture somewhat. Um, more of the activities, there's Jennifer Cabot. Jennifer Cabot and I have been friends since we were in eighth grade in Virginia. And so we did a conversation about um, that time in our lives and how it took us to now and some of the kind of themes that carried through our lives. And Jennifer's a great writer, um, historian, writes for art and um, culture and um, all kinds of different magazines. So this, to be honest, this, I mean, this, thing she wrote really blows me away every time I read it. It's really genius. So here we are talking. This was at the end. This, it says September 8th, 2017. Um, so this was the date that this happened. So this was at the closing party where I had um, a few people doing performances. There was Peggy Shaw, who is one of the people I worship in the world and have an eternal crush on, I confess. Um, I think many people do. And Peggy is a fucking genius. And she came and did a um, monologue. And then I had Amelia do also a song performance spoken word thing. And then uh, where's the other? Wasn't there one more person? Then Shelly. Uh, oh, I know, they didn't put Shelly in there in the closing party because Shelly's already in the book another time. I'm just realizing that. But I wanted to have three generations of Dykes um, doing uh, a live performance reading kind of thing. So Amelia was the millennial, Shelly was the Gen Xer slash baby boomer, I guess. And then Peggy was the elder. And that worked out really well. And then we had this new wave dance party and these are some photos from it. And then we have the checklist. There's the book cart with all the books and there's a beautiful list of every single book in there, in that cart. And then events that shows all the program that happened and when, and then my kind of CV, abbreviated CV up to 2018 some other installation images and then that's it so um yeah i think i could uh stop share now yeah um and i think also i just want to say for those of you who are participating uh, if you can get the book get your hands on the book that's great you can also take a look at this to see some of these resources but liz was a little bit downplaying that stuff at the end about the resources in the back of the, the book and for anybody who's interested about seeing what other people have been doing and working on in the last, you know, um, five years or so, this is an amazing resource uh, for being able to see interesting work that's out there. And um, I really appreciated the fact that you took the time that you did to put the list in the, in the bibliographies to, to get together there at the end, because it really is, it, it's a huge resource and, and like, and like other artist books or, or curators, um, you know, the, it, the, the catalog becomes a huge resource for us to be able to speak to um, the particular event of the exhibition 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And so for, for me, I really appreciate it because it, it gives us resource today, but then also it gives us reflection uh, decades later. So thank you for the work that you put into that. Sorry, sometimes I mute when I'm not talking to like try to avoid any potential background noise from my environment. Um, yeah, thank you, Hunter. I mean, it, I also have to thank the Tang staff, everybody there, and Beverly for all that they did to make this book happen. The staff, even some student interns, uh, a lot of people put a lot of time into this project because at a certain point I wasn't really working on the book. I mean, once the book production started, 
I provided some images and nudged some of my contributors to send in their essays and whatnot. But um, really, the, the Tang people and Beverly cranked out this book with a lot of um, energy. And uh, another wonderful thing is that the Beverly, uh, well, they chose this um, Spanish printer called SIL, S-Y-L. Um, and it's a women, women run uh, business in Spain. And they printed these books during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So um, the book came out, we, we got the final books, you know, in the boxes in June. So we were working on the proof and everything, you know, going back and forth with them and the binding was like a whole odyssey. I'd like to just show you the binding right now so you can see this thing that I alluded to earlier. Yes. So this is a very special, I forget what it's called, some book nerds will know. But it's great because it has this standard kind of hard binding. And then inside we have this, which you usually see a lot of books now have this as the outside binding. So I got both. And it's nice because it, it holds it in like that. Yeah, which is great. And just remind everybody, uh, I'm Hunter O'Haney from the Stonewall National Museum and Archives. And I'm here with Liz Collins. And we're talking about uh, the exhibition that she had at the Tang Museum at Skidmore Energy Field and the new catalog that just came out for that show and some of the work that's in that show. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to throw them into the chat or the Q&A part. And we'll get to those in the last part of our, of our talk. So uh, happy to have all of you here. And hello to our friends on Facebook. I understand there are a lot of people who are following us on Facebook as well. Um, and also to remind everybody, this will, is all being recorded and you can share it with your friends uh, or if people can't make it now, they can see it at some point in the future. It'll be on our website as well as at stonewall-museum.org. Um, so Liz, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the work you're, you're working on now, but, but you know, I, this is kind of the same question I asked in the beginning, but now that we have gone through the exhibition with you, um, what was it like going into this space and going into this community and um, bringing in these different voices and creating this situation, almost like a salon, and, uh, and you were bringing them in and you had to realize who the community was and who the constituency was. They were both faculty members and student members and, and the people who were around Skidmore itself. And so I'm still curious to hear more about your sense of interaction with the community and how you felt they responded to, to this. Well, I, I didn't come into the community as a new person. I came in knowing some about the place and the people because I had done another project there. Uh, I did a Knitting Nation project um, in, I think, 2000. I'm sorry, I don't remember. I think it was 2009 or 2012. Um, it's a blur now. But I, I did a, an installation there as part of Dan Straw. Oh, okay, so it must have been 2012 because Dan Straw was in 2011 at the ICA Boston. That was Helen Molesworth's, I th one of her last shows there. And so then Dan Straw traveled to the Tang and Ian invited me to do a static installation in that version of Dan Straw. At, at the ICA Boston, the projects I did there were one day events in the theater. So there was a whole static exhibition that lasted for several months, but I had the theater for two days and did these endurance kind of durational performance installation projects that I used to do called Knitting Nation. And so it was, uh, I, I got to, come in there and do an installation. So I got to know the staff of the Tang. Um, and when I start working with museums, I get to know everybody from the people who clean the place. You know, I, I, I'm a friendly person. I'm grateful to everybody who's helping me and doing what they do in the museum from the registrar, you know, the curators, security, 
the, the everybody. So I, I knew those people already. So I was excited to return. Um, I, I hadn't engaged much with the students and um, I don't know. I mean, it was, it, it was just, it was really wonderful to engage with people. I, there were times when the space was used that had nothing to do with me. There, it wasn't like I was living up there. You know, I, I went up there periodically, like every time there was a new iteration, I would go up with my artist friend, you know, like Nayland and Nayland's partner Lolita would go, you know, we're on the train and I went up on the train and we all had like a fun time and Nayland put his project up and, and then Evie the same thing. And, you know, every time, mostly every time someone came up, I was there. I think I actually wasn't there when Scott came up, but um, there was just this ongoing relationship happening. Um, and then I did also know some people in town and there's a whole other dimension to my relationship with the Tang, which has to do with another special institution in um, Saratoga Springs called Yaddo, which is um, very close by. And so um, actually I, I attribute my, my doing this installation to a studio visit that I did with Ian and the other, Rachel, the other Tang curator while I was in residence at, at Yaddo in 2014. Ian came to visit me and saw my work. We, we had already done the Knitting Nation together and um, he brought me this great catalog of a show they had done there. He curated with Jessica Stockholder, which called The Jewel Thief, which was just like a genius, genius show that had many artists and very kind of eclectic installation ideas. And it really influenced me. And so he was planting seeds so, um, you know, that I, I, it doesn't totally answer your question, but there's some, there's a nice connection there between the, like a lot of creative people are coming through Yaddo all the time. And so a lot of times there's a nice overlap. Sure. No, it, it really does. I mean, I guess what I was thinking about too was the idea of, um, and I know that you, that you have had some relationship with the area, but it wasn't a place where you actually lived. It wasn't like it was at the new museum or New York or someplace else. It was a place you had to go to. And, and you know, it would be frequented by people, particularly students and faculty that you might not necessarily know. And it, uh, so as you were talking about it, it just made me think about the idea that people who might be interested in doing, um, doing particularly group events like this and particularly those that last over a long period of time i mean two years i mean you're programming in the space over a two-year period of time primarily for a group of people that while you may be bringing some there you don't necessarily know a lot of the constituency other than in the bigger broader sense and so as people think about working on other projects that they're working on that may structurally be similar I was thinking more about some of the lessons that might that might have been learned in this process. Yeah, I mean, I'm also, I, I'm realizing as we're talking, there's something I'm not mentioning about that region, which is that it's upstate New York, you know, and it's also by Western Mass, like there's kind of the, the Mass Mocha and that whole zone of, of the Berkshires and the people like audiences from the Berkshires and upstate New York would co go to the Tang all the time, you know, because once you get up there, everybody's driving a half an hour for an hour to an hour for everything they're going to. So it's a very popular museum that people who live and go to those areas frequent. Um, so that's a big part of their community as well. And that also means some of the people, the artists and others who live in New York and have second homes up there, you know, they have a nice connection. But um, yeah, I mean, I learned so much from this project on so many levels about, I don't know, queering a museum, I suppose. <laughs> Well, it's true, and it's, it's, I mean, it certainly does seem that, that way, and also I think what's great is that it, it does seem in this project you were able to bring in 
a lot of people, other artists who you had confidence in, whose work that you liked, who you, who you wanted to interact with, and it gave you an opportunity to create that nexus of, of ideas and present them in a way, and it all worked out incredibly well. And I, I guess I, you know, to, to just wrap this part up, I just encourage the people that this is a great way of being able to present an idea out there that if you think it's important and, and if you think you can pull it off, it's a wonderful way of doing it. It's a great opportunity. We don't have a lot of time left, um, but I do want to, if we have a, a chance now, uh, to maybe look at some current work that you're that you're working on these days and see what's happening with you. Sure, I have I have a small slideshow. I want to ask though first, um, I can do it myself, or maybe um, you or um, Emery could post the link to the um, the book. So if people want to get this book, they can go to the website. It's the Tang Museum. He will go ahead. Uh, Emery will go ahead and post that in the chat uh, part there. Okay. And so cool. we'll get posted. Um, yeah, I just want people to be able to get, you know, if they want to actually get their hands on this book, they will be able to. So um, what I have here is, hold on, how do I do it? Is it, is it showing up for you as full screen? No, uh, just partial. I was trying something new and it didn't work. A new Zoom <laughs> command. Okay. So, wait, this isn't. Um, there you go, but much better. I just wanted to show you a few things that I was working on in August. Uh, I didn't do the thing I usually do and like crank until the last minute for an exhibition, meaning the show that I had at AMP that opened at the end of August wasn't something I was working on up until the last minute. And instead, when I was in Provincetown, I was um, working on other things. Like I finished this quilt piece that um, went into an exhibition at the end of August. And um, uh, it was Upstate Art Weekend. And so this and another piece were shown at the um, Starlight Hotel on a fence as part of a, a a group show that was really cool. But um, I, this, is, this was shot out at a dune shack, like out in the dunes of Provincetown. So I was hand stitching. Um, and this was a piece that I actually started at the beginning of the pandemic because Liza Liu, the artist who did the crazy bead installation that was in that Whitney craft survey show recently, that she's a well-known artist that shows at Lima Mopin. She started this project called um, apart together um, where she encouraged people to s start stitching, making a quilt um, from stuff around their houses. And we would get together sometimes on Instagram and like connect and stitch together. And so I started doing that. I kind of fell off the, the project here and there, but I really loved making it. So um, I wanted to finish that. Um, and needlepoint is something I do all the time uh, as like a home practice. And so when the, when the lockdown started, I was really going hard on the needlepoint. These two pictures are from my um, like dune check and then in town uh, stitching activities. And let then- me, Let me interrupt you there for a minute just because you and I talked about this a little bit and maybe people are not fully aware, but just give them a, a brief um, description of what a dune shack means on Cape Cod. Cape Cod oh. <laughs> well, dune shacks are the, sorry to just be so like, <laughs> you know, mysterious and name things that people might not know. Uh, but dune shacks are these, it's this um, group of little houses that were built many years ago in the dunes of Provincetown, like out in the periphery. Um, not in town, but far out in the dunes close to the ocean. And they've had a long history of creative people um, living there or going there. And um, some of them are owned by foundations now and organizations that maintain them and have residencies there that people go to. So I, I did my second time in a dune shack this summer. Great. It's a rustic kind of environment, you're out in the dunes, it's very remote. 
Um, there's no electricity and um, it's very, very quiet and beautiful. And um, the nature is very powerful out there. But this is in town on the bay. I was staying at this place, Poor Richard's Landing. I think that actually might be my mom <laughs> sitting on that pipe. <laughs> um, but then here's some images from the, uh, the show at AMP. So I did several needle points starting in March. And needle point is a kind of embroidery. It's this stitching onto a mesh substrate. And I've been doing it for years. I started doing it when I was a kid and then stopped doing it when I was a teen and then picked it up again about 10 years ago. So these are my COVID needle points, I call them. Um, they're small, they're like eight by eight. Uh, so I, I have this stair, you know, like ascension kind of staircase motif that's really been showing up a lot for me for the past few years. And um, so those are a few of the needle points. And here is the gallerist, um, Debbie. Uh, she's the owner of the gallery and that's my child, Winter, and they're looking at the needle points so you can see for scale. And here are a few pictures of the exhibition. So this exhibition is different than a lot that I have done in that it's primarily works, uh, two-dimensional works, wall works. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to um, put some of those out into the world so people could see you know, some of the roots of the textiles that I do, like a lot of it is um, at the core uh, a drawing and painting and collage practice that um, helps me work through ideas um, and just make make these pieces. You know, a lot of times I'm drawing and, and doing these artworks, not thinking of textiles at all and just generating visual experiences that are exciting for me. So, what I did last weekend after I left Provincetown, I came back to New York for a day and then turned around and went to up to Andover, Massachusetts, where um, I am having, or I am part of a six artist exhibition at the Addison Gallery of American Art in Andover. And it's on the campus, it's another academic campus. It's on the campus of Phillips Academy Andover, another kind of small town. And um, this is a piece that is on the wall that is between the art building for the school and the um, Addison Gallery, the museum. So the, the, art, the school building and the museum building are connected by this passageway. Um, and the exhibition within the, the museum is called Wayfinding and it's based on um, it, they invited the uh, six artists to respond to this antique map collection that the school has. And it's just mind blowing these maps, they're maps of the world. And uh, so this piece is actually based on a map of New England um, where I lifted, you can see in the lower part, I, there are all these lines that connect at points. I lifted the um, graphic imagery from that map um, of these navigational lines and distance lines and transpose that into a new kind of abstract geometry. So this is me and my friend Suzanne Wright, another fabulous artist who has just returned to New York after many years in Los Angeles and was recently on the Grant Wood Fellowship in Iowa. And uh, I invited Suzanne to help me do this mural as my hired hand, she's a way better painter than me. <laughs> you can see her fabulous technique there and uh, Gus, her dog. And um, yeah, so there's other stuff I've been working on, but Instagram is a really good place to see it. Um, I generally tend to post my projects as they happen. Um, yeah, so those are just a few things. I had a big mural. Um, installed in downtown Brooklyn that I was working on during the pandemic um, in the early months. It, it just opened on, uh, I think, mid, middle of July. It's at 15 Metro Tech and it goes, it's that J Street Metro Tech kind of plaza that goes from J Street to Flatbush. So I have a bank of like 18 windows that have a big kind of abstraction of, of directional lines on a black 
kind of um, background. It's really beautiful. That's great. No, it's great to see this work. It's great to see, I, I know that space uh, in Andover at Phillips Academy well, and so it's great to be able to see this work here. So we only have a few more minutes uh, left here. And so um, uh, let's just bring, there, there we go. Um, and so um, what's, what's gonna happen next? I mean, what, what, are you, what, what are you working on next after this? <laughs> um, I have a big show at the end of October in New York at a uh, great furniture company and showroom called Lean Rosé. It's a French furniture company. And I worked with them last year uh, in a project in Milan and Milan, Italy. And so this year they've commissioned me to do an installation in their space. It was supposed to happen in May during design month in New York. It's a big, you know, it's like a massive uh, endeavor that happens NYC by design. And with that installation, I'm launching a textile collection that I did with a textile company called Pollock. So I have a three fabric, three design, many colorway, uh, upholstery fabric collection that is going to be shown on these beautiful pieces of furniture, but also I'm making all of these um, textile paintings for the um, ceiling and walls. So that'll be something great. I'm working on that in the immediate and uh, trying to get my kid going in remote learning. <laughs> I think that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that is, of course, a challenge for everybody. What grade is winter in? Six. Six? Oh, my God. Crazy. Crazy. Well, Liz, it's been great to see you. It's great to have this chat. For those of you, um, this is the book, is the catalog. It's called Energy Field. Um, if you look in the chat section, you can see where to uh, get a copy of it. I want to thank you, Liz, for being here. It's been great to talk about it. And thank you for bringing a lot of these artists out. Um, you work so collaboratively with other artists. And I think it's, in some part, um, it seems like it's the nature of your, your work. Um, if people don't know it, um, there's a, a wonderful piece that Liz worked on for many years, probably a decade, called Knitting Knit Nation. Was it a decade? Yeah which was really, um, you should just take a look at it because it really is, it's been many different iterations and she's had a lot of different people involved in it. And it involves uh, the rainbow flag of, of all things. And um, it's just a wonderful piece. And so it's really, she's been a very strong supporter of a lot of the things that uh, we all have been looking at. So uh, Liz, stay in touch. We'll see you soon. Uh, come down to visit us. I'd love to show you the archives and um, and have you do a piece uh, based upon uh, what you find there. That sounds amazing. I love archives. I didn't get to say that earlier. Thanks for all the things you just said, Hunter. Really beautiful. I'm honored and um, I really appreciate you inviting me to do this and I appreciate everybody showing up to listen. This is a time of a lot of talks. I don't know if people are getting sick of hearing from me on Zoom, but it just, you know, there's a lot converging right now. And I think these talks are a fabulous way to connect with people um, in the absence of the things that we usually do in real life. Um, I'd love to come down there and um, I can't wait to learn more about um, the Stonewall Archives and Museum or Museum and Archives as soon as possible. All right, well, uh, if you want to come down and see us here. So again, uh, stonewall-museum.org. Uh, we are open to the public. Uh, we just opened a show last week called Elected Sisters, which is about lesbian, bi, and trans women who were the first elected people in various parts of the country. And so as we all have the election on our mind right now, it's a great way of uh, thinking about women who are pioneers. Um, and my only last piece of advice to everybody, I have two last pieces of advice. Uh, next week, join us uh, with Jane Fleshman, who will be here on uh, her book called The Stonewall Generation. Um, and that's very important. And then my other piece of advice, um, or request, I have to say, is please be sure you're registered to vote. Everybody around you is registered to vote. And no matter who you vote for, just get out there and vote. <laughs>
It's the most important thing that we can do right now. Okay. So thank you all. Emery, will you show yourself again? And I uh, just want to say thank you. You're great. Nice to see you. And, uh, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.